Is there any final questions, Dr. Dennett, you might have for Ricardo or Ricardo for, for Dr. Dennett? Yeah, I'm, I've said mine piece. Okay. I, I, yeah, I just think that, um, that first of all, thank you, uh, Daniel, for, uh, Daniel, for joining, um, for joining us. And, um, I think there is immense potential in AI in the future in general. I do agree with uh, some of the concerns that have been outlined, outlined by uh, Daniel. And I, going circling back to the point about uh, not just control, but how can we build tools or culture around us that can help us basically um, direct our moral deliberation uh, better. And I think uh, in this specific context as well, AI stands as an opportunity, not just a, because it's not just going to be a tool, but it's going to be potentially an artificial mind, a mind itself that every person can have in a way. And if we can find a way for this mind to truly understand it and extrapolate the evolution of a person, for instance, and even imagine well, um, you know, uh, the, the, the volition and the actions of the person in a uh, more ideal state or more ethical state could be, by considering the different, uh, you know, ramifications and implications of phenomenal reality, I think that uh, that stands as like a, an opportunity for us to redirect our deliberation in the world as well. Having another mind that can, you know, direct us and check on us and help us understand uh, better the wider uh, implications of of our, you know, phenomenal reality. Uh, I think that's really something uh, exciting to look for. Uh, compared to uh, just thinking about AI as a, an additional technological tool um, that is going to just increase the degree of, of freedom uh, of actions that we have that we have in this world. And yeah. I think in that sense, ontologically, it's like the nature of the piece of technology uh, makes, a, makes an important difference in the way that I think we should think about um, moral deliberation, but not just moral de deliberation, but our deliberation in, in the future, especially in the long term, so not just in the in the immediate term, short term context. Well, I, what you said makes me want to add one more thing, mm -hmm. and that is the GPS problem, the spelling and grammar problem. We now have machines that can tell us where we are and correct our spelling and correct our grammar. And so we're losing abilities mm. that we used to have because we don't, we're not tested on them anymore. And we're becoming more dependent than ever on these correctors, these editors, these, these, you know, who knows how to read a map anymore. You read Robinson Crusoe and you, encounter this man who in the 18th century, of course, fiction, but the things he knows how to do, very few people know how to do those things today. But, but, and, that's and, and if, if we outsource our ethical thinking, our moral thinking to a presumably benign advisor, we're going to lose the practice we get making moral decisions every day. Mm. But there is also another view, I think, in this one, I want to push back a, a little bit on is the idea that our technological tools and culture are somehow an extension of our cognition, right? And that's like what basically Clark has argued in the past as well. And if we consider AI and these other tools as an amplification of our cognition, so not just outsourcing, it's not really merely outsourcing things, but rather considering these things, which are ultimately our inventions, right? These are artificial inventions that come from us. They don't come from nature spontaneously. So I think we should consider this as cognitive augmentation of our own being in a way because we created them and we made them and, and that's the case for ai as well i think and uh, and and they're just going to help us uh, augment our actions in the world and I, I i wonder if your point daniel is about the more cognitive uh, aspects of this kind of outsourcing practice like are you concerned about us losing sight 
of not just you know our moral deliberation and actions, but also our capacities, our kindly capacities, and just turning into this kindly dependence in which we are no longer capable of doing anything uh, because everything is outsourced in, in your thinking, or is your concern or something something else that, that I'm not seeing? Well, it used to be the case, mm -hmm. as Richard Feynman liked to observe, that if you can make it, you understand it. If you can design and make it, you understand it. And that was true of the printing press and the typewriter and the telephone and the television, but it's not true of software. Mm. The creation of software is already, to use Marx's term, alienated from us. There's software writing programs and programs that can write software better than programmers, coders can. So we're losing our epistemic hegemony over our own technical achievements. So you say, well, we made it. These are our things. Yeah, that's like saying, well, I made my children. Do I have control over them? Am I responsible for everything I, they do? Well, in a way, yes, you are. But it's, it's, it's tough because unless you work really hard, some of, the, you know, some of your children may turn out to do really lamentable things. So I think we should not trust engineers and coders, software engineers, to assure us that since they're making it, and they're making it with good intentions, that we should trust that. No, I don't agree with that. Absolutely not. That I, is baloney, and anybody who says that should be ashamed. I, I do agree with that. Uh, and I think that circles back to the problem of machine ethics. What kind of values and ethics are we actually encoding in the systems? Are we going to leave that responsibility to the engineers and the coders? I don't think that's the answer. I completely agree with that. That's why I think that we should build a piece of technology that is capable of autonomously extrapolating that code of humanity by, by process of osmosis, basically. That's, I think, the only one of the most optimal options that we have.